Hi, Internet! Today, we're going to talk about genre. You might be a little familiar with genre from school or libraries or bookstores. Most familiar are probably subgenres of books like fantasy novels or narrative poems. And while those are certainly genres, that's not quite what we're going to be talking about today. So, what is a genre? A good definition of genre might be this. A category of artistic, musical, or literary composition characterized by a particular style, form, or content. Another good definition is this. Kind or sort. But genre can be more than just a category of painting or literature. Types of genres can include things like listicles or magazines, your teacher's lessons plan, zoning codes, graffiti, or even informational YouTube videos. Each instance within a genre is referred to as a text. Now, text doesn't just mean written language. A GIF, a video game, a picture, a movie, all of this could be considered the text. The text just refers to an object that is being studied, especially in this context as a genre. Genres are formed when there are enough example texts that could be grouped together to do similar formal conventions or similar functions. Genres are dynamic, meaning they're open to change and growth. Over time, new genres are invented, and sometimes the use of old ones are discontinued. Often, works fit into multiple genres by way of borrowing and recombining these conventions from old and new genres. An older genre which precedes a newer genre is called an antecedent genre, and it is sort of like the mother from which all other deviations are born. It's helpful, actually, to think of genres sort of like a family. Let's say we have the first work of science fiction, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Now, let's take the first hand-drawn animation, which I'm definitely going to mispronounce, Phantasmagory, which is a French film created at the turn of the century, 1900, uh, which largely consisted of just a stick figure moving around and encountering morphing objects. Now, these could both be considered antecedent genres of the modern science fiction animation, like Don Hertzfeld's twisting hand-drawn film, It's Such a Beautiful Day, which, if you haven't watched, you should watch. So now we have a little genre family. Frankenstein, Phantasmagory, and brand new It's Such a Beautiful Day. You could potentially keep connecting genre families into complicated trees of influence and antecedent genres. Eventually, new genres are produced as more texts are added, and so on and so forth ad infinitum. Wait a minute, Hannah. How did we get all of these genres? What are they? <laughs> I'm glad you asked me. I'll tell you. Genre as a thing in Western society began as an absolute classification system for ancient Greek literature. Poetry, prose, and performance each had specific and calculated style that related to the theme of the story. Even actors were actually restricted to their genre because the Greeks assumed that only a specific type of person could tell one type of story best. The genre further developed over time in response to changes and audiences and creators. The best thing about genre is that it's a dynamic tool to help the public codify texts. It acts as a warning sign for a type of experience. 
genre is most viable as a classification system when it's adaptable and flexible, willing to commingle with other genres. However, a certain level of fixity is required for the integrity of a specific genre to be maintained. So, cool! Now we know where genre came from and what can be classified as a genre. So what now? Well, lucky us, there's actually a whole field of study on the way we interact with and experience genres and how genres help constitute or create ourselves. This field of study is fittingly titled Genre Studies. Genre studies falls under the larger field of rhetorical study. Rhetoric is the art of discourse that aims to improve the capability of writers or speakers to inform, persuade, or motivate particular audiences in specific situations. In the study of how we communicate, a rhetor is the author or speaker. Like in the case of this video, I am the rhetor and you, the viewer, are my rhetorical audience. Charles Bazerman writes about how genres act as anchors for audiences. When you encounter a genre, you know what you are getting yourself into and what range of relations and objects will likely be realized there. When you enter a classroom, a house of worship, or a restaurant, you know what to expect, like certain behaviors, certain types of communication, and even certain types of power dynamics. Genre acts the same way. If you're reading a fantasy novel, you expect there to be magic and adventure. If you watch an action movie, you're probably expecting explosions. Anthony Paré studies and writes about the relationship between language and ideology, which is to say how the words we use shape ourselves and others. Specifically, he analyzes genres for the way their conventions restrict or free both the writer and the audience from power dynamics, as well as the value systems that genres can promote. He asks us to think critically about genres. For whom do they work, he asks. To what end? Do they work equally for all who participate in or are affected by them? For example, Pari talks about Canadian Inuit social workers who had trouble writing official reports on the members of their communities. They found the impersonal language required of them in these reports to be alienating and rude towards people who were not only their patients, but also their friends and family members. These workers were caught between two identities, their role as agents of the state and that of members of a particular oppressed community. Pare explains, The degree of explicit detail required in documentation meant exposing their clients, all of whom were friends, family, or acquaintances, to the white authorities. Most painfully for the workers, records reduced their clients' stories to narratives of failure and textually organized their lives under institutional and cultural categories of dysfunction and deviation. It's pretty clear in this example the power dynamics at play in the way these social workers are being asked to write about their own communities. They have power over how their friends and families are being viewed by a dominant culture, and they feel torn. The way the genre of social work reports works involves putting these workers between a rock and a hard place, the rock of their communities versus the hard place of being employed. Interestingly, the same exact genre is read as being necessary and good by many white urban social workers. They value the distance that language like it is recommended or the underside concludes that puts between their work selves and their personal selves. In fact, the language of these documents is employed specifically to create that distance and be perceived as impartial, officious, and detached. Wait a minute, Hannah. What does any of this have to do with fantasy novels or genre? <laughs> Great question, Hannah. Let me tell you. The study of genre theory allows us to analyze the words we come in contact with on a daily basis. What are the power dynamics of a restaurant menu? What values do a receipt promote? 
What kind of person does your IRS tax form ask you to be? For that matter, what kind of person does this video ask you to be? A student? A skeptic? An activist? Genre studies help us to deconstruct what we take for granted. The five-paragraph essay, voting ballots, Facebook pages, and allows us to see them as constructed entities which we may or may not have the power to deconstruct. It asks us to think about why certain areas are zoned certain ways and who that benefits, why certain laws are written the way they are and made to seem as natural when really there's something we made up. Genre studies is more than just analyzing the formal characteristics of a tweet. It's about understanding the political power of 140 characters. So thanks for watching, you guys. This video was made for a school project where we had to analyze and write about a genre and then perform or recreate that genre. And I had chosen YouTube infotainment videos because there's something that I love and love watching. And I thought it would be a really fun final project um, and is sort of one of the last projects I'm doing as an undergraduate in college, which is also very exciting. Um, I would really like to thank my professor, Betsy Verhoeven, for this assignment and for her class. It's been an absolute pleasure being in it. Uh, and if anyone is at Susquehanna University, they should definitely take her class. It's super great. Um, and that's it. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.